Hey guys, totally random video here. You can see that Hipfuse is totally not prepared to do this, but um, I just wanted to see if I could do a Google Hangout and get anybody brave enough to come on and do some political bantering, some historical talk, um, see what connections and ideas we can come up with um, about the 2012 presidential election because I like to talk about politics and I don't get to do it enough. So um, I don't know what to do other than to wait for a minute or here because I think we're streaming through YouTube. Um, I like Johnny Cash. It's Noam Chomsky. Um, if you don't know who I am or if you haven't seen my channel before, I am a social studies teacher from Buffalo, New York. Um, I started making YouTube videos a few years ago, and um, I kind of do that as kind of like a hobby, um, trying to find great multimodal ways to present um, knowledge to kids. Um, in the classroom, I, I do lecture, but um, I also do a lot of uh, composition projects with students. Um, we make videos and podcasts and websites and um, things of that nature in order to kind of apply that knowledge that we're presenting in some of those lectures. Um, I can do this for a little while. I can just talk to nothing this year. And also, I can do a couple things. I can give myself a, make it a little more interesting to watch Mr. Hughes here. I can give myself devil horns. I know I can do that. So, um, listen to the devil. That's awful advice. It's a joke. I can keep my devil horns on for a little while. Um, but, you know, in terms of my philosophy of education, I could talk about that for a few minutes. Um, I believe that um, in order to learn anything, that you need to be engaged in what you're doing. Um, so I have this stupid kind of logo that I, I kind of say, or slogan, I guess, um, where attention goes, energy flows. And um, I always want to give credit to somebody for, for that slogan because it's not mine. And I always think, uh, what was the damn book that I read? Um, Dancing Wooly Masters. I think I ripped it from that book, which is about quantum physics, and that's a whole different video. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I believe that you have to be authentically engaged, and if you are um, in a public high school and you walk by a lot of classrooms, um, that's probably not occurring as much as it should be. Let's just put it that way. So as an educator, I've been trying to find you know, ways to engage children. Um, not in a weird way, guys. Uh, but one of my favorite words in the English language, I have a couple of them, but one of them is multimodality. And multimodality, i got to take the double horns off. i just got to do it. Yeah. Uh, multimodality basically means kind of being aware um, of understanding all of the different ways of presenting meaning. So you might have heard the word literacy before. Um, and in the olden days, if the double horns came back by themselves, I swear to goodness, that is a little freaky. I think that maybe there's a ghost in the room. I swear to goodness, I didn't do that. No. I can't turn the devil horns off. Now this is just becoming a big joke. That's the clown. We don't want that. That's ridiculous. A monster. Could you turn it off? Guys, this is ridiculous because I'm going to Forget everything that I said. Remove all effects. There's the button right there. Good for me. <laughs> um, but basically, ways to get kids engaged. And now I hear a beep on my computer. Get this other guy I'm supposed to be talking with. Code 3. The chat is no longer off the record. I don't know what that means. Um, nevertheless, um, multimodality, um, back to that word, basically means going beyond the traditional approach to literacy. Literacy in the old days meaning basically reading and writing. And that is ever most important. I believe that that's the, probably the two main literacy modes that we use as human beings. But as an educator, finding different modes of literacy, what we call new literacies today. So composing a video or using body language or uh, being able to mix a record or you know, audio track or something like that. Or build a website. Um, all of these are ways of representing the world around us. So as an educator, I believe I have to use multimodality in two ways. One is to present meaning. And a lot of my newer lecture videos are an example of that. Uh, I would call this kind of explicit multimodal presentations, where you frame a big essential question, like why the Civil War occurred, or um, the causes and effects of the Cold War. And you use your body, your hands, the green screen, Noam Chomsky, jokes, 
um, video, song, sound effects, links, nods, anything in that multimodality layering idea in order for students to get kind of like all of these different ways to engage themselves with the meaning. And this might be, you know, I don't know if it's causal, I don't know if it's we do this because kids' attention has changed because of technology, or if it's just a better way of doing it. But either, the way, I, either way, I believe it works better today. So um, it's a little edutainment, but I think that in order to be a strong presenter of knowledge, that you need to be able to embrace multimodality. And that doesn't mean you have to be a jokester all the time, but it does mean that you have to be aware of the visual word, of the audio concept, of the uh, way that you're presenting yourself. Um, and the traditional textual, sometimes you'll see vocab words on the screen or you know, definitions and those types of things. Um, but that's all knowledge based. That's all presentational. That's all basically, you know, me telling you I was cursed. Me telling me you beep, I know, so you will know it. Um, and doing that through, like I said, a, a differentiation of mechanisms. Um, but that's I think like maybe twenty five percent of education, thirty percent of education. I think that's important. I think it's important for building like a discourse base, a discourse of way you talk about things. So we all kind of have common vocabulary. And that's like a different idea about presentational knowledge, I believe. Um, I believe, I feel like I'm on a, a you know, NPR show. This is where I believe. Um, but I do believe that students of all stripes and, and, and stages um, are intelligent because they're human beings. They're intelligent because they have a way of understanding the world around them. Um, everybody has a story. Everybody has, you know, inside knowledge. Some it's broader and more specific or whatever. But um, everybody understands like human concepts, um, and I think that some students you use the vocabulary we use in school at home as well. So kids that go home and their parents are watching the news or the dinner table are having a discussion about economics or whatever, that student's world kind of matches the educational world pretty nicely because teachers are talking like that as well. So there's a lot of nodding, and teachers feel as though, wow, I'm a strong teacher because these kids understand what I'm teaching them. The, the, the harder job is when you have a student that doesn't have that academic discourse, that academic way of understanding the world around them. So what you need to do then as an educator, and, and I think that this is a better way for those kids that use the discourse anyway, because it's giving them new ways of understanding the world around them, is to try to create a bridge between what that student knows and what you want them to know. To use like universal concepts and universal meanings, um, whether that be um, celebrations or relationships or um, you know ways humans interact through violence or whatever it might be in order to create analogies and symbolism um, and visual ideas in order for that student to number one plug in number one to go that person knows my world and talks like me so therefore I'm more likely to cross that bridge into that academic world rather than just kind of getting like yeah hey, I don't know you're using, you're using words man so I don't know what that word means or xenophobia or nativism or something like that um, but the, the, the bigger idea is, is, that, is that students do know what those concepts mean. They just don't know how to walk between those two worlds. So I think that's an important you know, kind of asset of learning as well in the presentational knowledge, storytelling, and having ways not just to talk in the academic discourse, but also in student discourse and understanding your audience and engaging them. Man, that is so important. Because when you engage them in that knowledge piece, um, it's like, you know, they're more likely to be engaged with the rest of the um, things that you plan on doing with them. Um, if you scare them off, if they're frightened, um, you're not going to engage them. And where attention goes, energy flows. So if you don't have their engagement, you don't have their intention. If you don't have their intention, you don't have a chance at learning. Because learning occurs inside that kid's head. And if you don't have attention and energy and engagement, then you're not going to be able to facilitate an experience in this next piece of education, which is the inquiry piece, in order to get the real learning. So what I, I'm talking about, and I'm just kind of talking crazy, uh, putting an educational philosophy video up, I guess, is the idea that education is first presentational, like there's a knowledge piece, I'm saying 25%, but I don't know where I got that number from, like a basic understanding of, of a roadmap of facts, of, of knowing things, of uh, you know, um, being able to talk about the subject, to be able to engage in the subject. And then so much more of that learning in the details and the stories and the vocab comes in when the student engages with that material. When the student takes what they know and applies it in order to compose something that they're um, willing to do, that they want to do, and that they're curious about doing. 
And people that go, oh, when I was a kid, I had to do it because they told me to do it. You know, I don't know why that's not true anymore. Um, maybe it's because of the internet, and uh, you know, I don't know why. I don't. But I think I think that students are looking for a, a reason to engage, other than just for the pure reason of learning. Um, maybe it's because a lot of them have done everything that they were supposed to do, and uh, they still feel like they can't afford college. They still can't, you know, participate in the middle class. So they figure. Um, schools a waste of time. So let's engage them and give them real skills in order for them to apply to the world around them. And I think that some of those are problem solving skills. Like there's a, a really great researcher, James Paul G, who I'm going to misquote the book, but something like what video games have to teach us about good learning. And part of the reasoning, it's not that kids should play video games. People go, oh, you're playing Pac-Man. No, no, they're not going to play Pac-Man in class. But what video games do to engage kids is that they, they challenge them at the point of need. They skill build them. They give them a reason to, you know, kids will spend like 18 hours the stupid video game and soil themselves. You ask people in education class, how long can a kid pay attention? And they're like, oh, it's their age plus half. You know, 24 minutes for an 18 year old. 27 would be 26. I'm terrible at math. But, but that's a joke because, of course, you can engage longer than that because you just soil yourself because you're on the 15th hour of, you know, wing hut hawk mission or whatever the hell you're playing. And you're doing that for the simple reason is you want to kill the blue lizard. So if we can give them a reason, a real reason, like you can create something that's bigger than you or you can, you know, gain a skill that's going to give you access to the world around you, um, that these are really, really desirable things and things we should be doing anyway. So let's talk about the inquiry piece. What I'm talking about here is what students should be doing in classrooms other than obtaining knowledge. And a lot of that knowledge can happen at home now. It's called flipping. And then, you know, doing Q&A and discussion in class if the kid, you know, actually watches the video. But whatever. Let's say that, you know, you've gone through that. You have like 80% mastery. Most of the kids know 80% of the material. You can have a conversation about, you know, bloody Kansas with the kid or, you know, you can talk about, you know, uh, I don't know, checks and balances, and the kid's not like a moron. Is to then have the kid engage like an historian would do, engage, but in something that appeals to their world and gives them skills that is going to be applicable to their world. And those are digital skills. So you can build a podcast. I love genres. So the, the idea of if you're going to do a podcast, don't be like, make a podcast about civil war. or you know, Make it fun. You know, make it, you know, why don't you make a radio show or a commercial or, you know, a song for the radio or something, something that kids can understand and modernize it and make the concept, you know, engaging. And then let's do some traditional literacy. Let's, you know, do a graphic organizer and research and write a paper and, you know, um, do what we would consider schooling is supposed to be doing. But the student is doing it because they're, they're ready to compose. They're ready to create this digital product that they want to, you know, build for their portfolio or for, you know, their identity or for, you know, whatever. You know, when you write a four-paragraph essay and you get it back and it says A, you know, or B, or whatever, you know what you do with it? You know what you do with it, right? It goes in the fridge for a day or it's at the bottom of the locker or make a paper airplane. But if you make a two-minute or a one-minute, you know, political video that's really spectacular and has sound effects and music in the back and it's all this cool ideas about politics or history or whatever, what do you do when you're done? You can't throw it away because it lives on forever. So therefore, your identity is like meshed with it. So it's that meshing of identity that creates some of that engagement. It goes back. It's like everything I'm talking about goes back to engagement, engagement, attention, attention. And there's tons of other things that you can do. And this is across all curriculum. So, you know, imagine if you're in a science class and rather than just drill and kill for the test and, you know, follow synthesis, celluloid, you know, you actually, let's say, had to put a uh, Facebook page for Charles Darwin up, you know, or you had to um, invent a new product that did photosynthesis. I'm making stuff up because I don't know about science a lot, other than what I hear on NPR. But nevertheless, you could do that as a podcast, or you could build a website or a Facebook page. Or I, I love digital video projects, a commercial, a public service announcement. Um, if you're an English teacher, what about having your kids, you know, have a political campaign for Holden Caulfield? What about that? You know, and then having a big screening at the local theater and inviting the community down. Um, these types of engagements, I think, is what students should be doing. And that means that we need to go to a laptop world, to a, you know, a, a pad world, to um, 
using what the world uses in order to create educational um, learning experiences for kids. So I guess that's it. I just talked, and this was supposed to be about political babbling. I'm always afraid to talk about politics because I'm a teacher. And I don't want to be on Bill O'Reilly or something like that and getting in big trouble. Um, but I would ask everybody to engage with politics at a rational, you know, reasonable level. I think that we all need to turn down the political discourse um, because things have gotten so partisan, and we won't go into that too much other than to say is that, you know, you can't hear, hear conversation anymore because of all the static electric you know, noise that's going on in the political atmosphere. So there seems like there's no chance for dialogue. Um, and what I would say is nobody is not um, outside. Everybody's an American, so we all need to sit down and shut up and listen for a little while and see if we can't figure things out of this mess. So nevertheless, I didn't get any people to visit, so I don't know what that says about Mr. Hughes. Um, but uh, I hope that you enjoyed my little mini lecture. Um, if you guys get a chance, uh, subscribe to Polypop, um, which I'm a, a member of that network through Maker Studios, and we do political debates online, and um, they uh, help push some of these educational videos that you guys have been watching, so other kids can um, watch them as well. And uh, you know, I don't want to like self plug here, but I'd love it if you tweeted my you know YouTube page, or, uh, Facebook, or do whatever you do in order to uh, get some more people here so we can uh, share the love of learning. I think I just got nauseous. All right, guys, this is Sip Hughes. This is Hughes DV. Um, I'm out of here. Uh, me and Noam Chomsky, we're going to go, uh, you know. Yeah. All right, see ya. Johnny Cash. And a ring of fire. <laughs>